as you can see in the bulletin, am I on? Okay. As you can see in the bulletin, the name of the sermonette is Authority, Humility, and Communion. And you might be wondering, what does authority have to do with communion? Humility might be a little easier to see the connection, but I hope all things will become clear uh, by the time I share a few thoughts. So I'd like to start with this question. In the New Testament church, and many who are here this morning don't answer. <laughs> In the New Testament church, who had authority? In Paul's description of the church as a body, who is the head? Christ, yeah, Ephesians 1, 21 to 23, Ephesians 4, 15, real clear, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. That means Christ is the leader, Christ is the director, Christ is the one who has authority. Now, in Paul's description of the church as a building, the temple of God, what part of that building represents Christ? All right, look at the scripture reading, if you don't mind opening your Bible to there. Um, Ephesians 2, 19 says, and this is talking to the Gentiles, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The household of God is a building. And verse 20 says, Which are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. So what part of the building is Christ? The yeah, he's the cornerstone. He's the base. He's the one who holds everything up. But what was the role of the apostles with the church when it's described as a building or as a temple? What did it say? The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So who, who had authority in the New Testament church? The apostles. Their authority, of course, was based on Christ. So why were the apostles fit to have authority? Well, we might say, well, they actually knew Jesus personally. Their lives were transformed by their encounter with Jesus, and they knew what Jesus taught. In fact, that's kind of what made them apostles in a way. Uh, but that's not the only reason, the thing that made them fit. They knew how the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled in Jesus. They were authorities on the Old Testament scriptures, not in authorities the same way the Pharisees were, they saw the new life. They saw the applications of the Old Testament in the life of Jesus. And that made them fit to be authoritative in the church. And then my third reason they were fit to have authority is the apostles also had the gift of prophecy, which means they could speak the will of God. So when the apostles had all passed away, who had authority in the church then? What did Ephesians 2.20 say the church was built upon? The foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Has the authority changed? It has not changed. But the question is, but what if they're not there anymore? How could the church be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets if they're not there? That's right. This is the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles and prophets. But what you just said, answering it as the word of God, it wasn't that clear at the time the apostles died. In fact, well, let me ask a question. How do you think the elders of the churches felt after the apostles were gone? Now, you do understand that in the New Testament church, there was no such thing as a church pastor. You all know that, don't you? It was the apostles who had the authority and went around, and then the local elders ran the churches. And so when the apostles were gone, how do you think those local elders felt? Do you think they felt a great void in leadership? You can be sure they did. The New Testament hadn't been gathered together yet. They didn't have the New Testament. Some of them were aware of certain epistles and maybe had heard them, but they did not have the New Testament. They were still teaching mostly out of the Old Testament, but they were making the applications that are things that are in the New Testament today. But here's where the dilemma came up. When you have a vacuum of leadership, it opens a way for people with 
ulterior motives to act. And so false teachers began to come up in the church and um, a few influential Christians or elders teaching their own ideas. How were the legitimate church elders to deal with that without the apostles there? What would give them the authority to deal with that? In fact, the idea actually came from one of the false teachers, this guy named Marcion, who claimed he had authority passed down to him from the apostle Peter. Or maybe it was Paul. I can't remember which one. This is how he reasoned it. Um, you know, Peter taught so-and-so, and that person taught so-and-so, and that person taught so-and-so, and that person was my teacher. Therefore, the authority of the apostles has been passed down through their, through their teachings, and now I have it. That's what Marcion was saying. The problem with Marcion is um, he had a kind of a long line to try to prove his, his authority, and it, but it sounded convincing to people. And the leading church elder or bishop of the city of Lyon, which is in modern-day France, a guy by the name of Irenaeus, Irenaeus realized that he had a more impressive connection to the Apostle Paul because Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp, and Polycarp was one of John's disciples. And so he went with that to try to show he had more authority than Marcion, and thus began the idea or the teaching that the authority was passed through persons, apostolic succession. Authority was placed in men instead of in the scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't believe the scriptures had authority. They did. But when there were heretics to be dealt with, well, you had to deal with them. Now, another way authority was put in man kind of connects to what we're doing today. It was the way changes were made in the thinking and how they taught about communion. So Ignatius, who was a leading elder at that famous city of Antioch from the book of Acts, he was the bishop of Antioch. About 10 years after the apostle Paul died, he began to teach that there was some kind of merit in the bread and wine that granted immortality. Our salvation. He called it the magic of immortality, was in the, what he called the Eucharist. And this naturally raised the profile of those who dispensed bread and wine and blessed it. It made them kind of authoritative. And later in the 200s, Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage in North Africa, united all the bishops and priests of North Africa in teaching that only bishops had the authority to grant communion only they had the authority to determine who could or could not have communion. See, what they were trying to do is they wanted to be able to say heretics can't do it and have it be accepted. Well, you understand, if immortality or salvation is in the bread and wine, then who has authority over who can be saved? The bishops. And by the way, they did not give that authority to the priests. The priests only had that authority when they were under the bishop. So the bishops had the authority over salvation. So who has the authority? Well, if it's the bishops, it's also the church because they represent the church. Um, if you're a little confused about bishops and priests, bishops were just considered higher ranking priests and other priests were under them. But as you can see, these false teachings of apostolic succession and the distortions of the community service led to authority being put in church leaders and bishops in the church. But where did authority really reside? In the word of God. Amen. So now, we want to contrast this seeking of authority with true humility. Because, you know, we know that, well, we call it the ordinance of humility, right? Right? The foot washing, it emphasizes meekness. It emphasizes setting self aside, the willingness to make things right with one, one another, to, to make restitution, to have reconciliation instead of just let problems fester. It's a willingness to serve one another and finding unity in the church because we can be humble together. It's all about heart work, a full surrender of the heart. 
before going into the communion service, which symbolizes our salvation and new life in Christ. The story of the Last Supper in the, is in the Gospels is where we get much of our understanding of the, uh, what communion means, the communion service. And, you know, uh, our, one of our, well, our elder, Tim, uh, he shared a quote from the Council to the Church that uh, was real clear how communion was instituted to replace Passover. But I would like to focus on, um, well, Desire of Age chapter 71 has everything I'm going to refer to from this point on. Um, when I quote from Spirit Prophecy. But I want to think for a moment, recall what was going on with the disciples when they came to the upper room. There was dissension among the disciples, right? What was the big question in their mind? Who will be the greatest? That's another way of saying, well, who will have authority? It's the same issue, right? And so John's gospel is the only one that tells about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That's in John 13. And if you want to open your Bible there, we're going to look at some verses of John 13 in in just a moment. Um, But in the early verses of John 13, you're familiar with the story. It tells how Peter at first refused to let Jesus wash his feet. However, we, as we read the story, we find out that Peter did surrender his pride and self-will, and he let Jesus wash his feet. And I'm going to share with you from Desire of Ages 646, and this is after Jesus washed all the disciples' feet. Desire of Ages uh, 646 says, When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from their feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. This was a far more consequence than washing the washing of their dusty feet. With the spirit they had, they then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ. Until brought into a state of humility and love, they were not prepared to partake of the Paschal Supper or to share in the memorial service which Christ was about to institute. Their hearts must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred. But all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. So now, um, oh yeah, there's a couple more excerpts here because she makes application. You know how she always does that, right? She talks about what's going on with them and then she says, and like us. So she says, like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ, yet often through contact with evil and the heart and the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. He alone can wash us clean. We are not prepared for communion with him unless cleansed by his efficacy. And that's why the ordinance of humility has to be done first. It's the preparation, right? All right, so let's go to John 13. And I want to pick up with verse 12. Jesus has just washed their feet. And verse 12 says, So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? He says, Do you understand what I've done? He says, You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I want you to think for a minute. When he says, verse 13, ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. Think about this for a minute. He's saying, I am God the Son. I am the creator of the universe, one with the Father. I am infinite. It's who I am. And yet I just washed your feet. He's, he's asking them, do you really get this? Now, I want you to think about it for a minute, because most of you probably have run into people that are anti-Trinitarian. Anti-Trinitarians totally misrepresent the purpose of the second person of the Godhead. The second person of the Godhead represented submission and self-sacrificing love and always has. As Michael the Archangel, he was when, when God told the angels who he really was, they said, but... But he submitted to you. How can he be equal to you? This is hard for us sometimes to grasp. But the Son of God, whether he's Michael the Archangel, whether he's 
the Son of God or Jesus, He has always represented the same thing through all eternity. He has always represented the principle of self-sacrificing love and submission. And He represented that by being submitted to His Father. And here He is in the, this ordinance of humility, just carrying on with what He's always been. Serving, submitting. He, play, he played the part of a servant. You know, and Peter wouldn't let Him do it at first because that's too low for you. And then Jesus, after they're done, says, do you, know, do you get what I've done as master and Lord? He goes, I, and I am. And he says, verse 14, let's read that again. If, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Amen. That's the principle of the Godhead. And Jesus is asking us to live that principle too. And in verse 17, he says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I just love that. So in Desire of Ages, it says, Jesus was given to stand at the head of humanity, that by his example he might teach what it means to minister. Get this, his whole life was under a law of service. He served all, ministered to all, thus he lived the law of God, and by his example showed how we are to obey it. So his whole life was under a law of service. I want to continue here in Desire of Ages. It says, again and again, Jesus had tried to establish this principle among his disciples. When James and John made their request for preeminence, he said, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Yeah. He, and then basically he's saying, in my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. The only greatness is the greatness of humility. The only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. Amen. Now, having washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And she's going on saying, this meant more than the washing of feet of guests to remove dust from travel. Christ was here instituting a religious service. By the act of our Lord, this humili humiliating ceremony was made a consecrated ordinance. It was to be observed by the disciples that they might ever keep in mind his lessons of humility and service. So why does the foot washing ordinance of humility come before the communion service? I think we know, right? Well, continuing, this ordinance is Christ's appointed preparation for the sacramental service. While pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of his body and his blood. Therefore it was that Jesus appointed the memorial of his humiliation to be first observed. Even now, right now, we need the ordinance of humility. I think sometimes it's very easy for human beings, especially when we're doing pretty good, to underestimate our own nature. And so I'm going to continue in this chapter in Desire of Ages. It says, There is in man a disposition to esteem himself more highly than his brother, to work for self, to seek the highest place, and often this results in evil surmisings and bitterness of spirit. You know, when we don't think, we don't, when we don't give other people the benefit of the doubt, when we think something bad of them, sometimes it's simply a choice we're making. We don't even have evidence. We just surmise the negative. And it comes natural to us as fallen human beings. And she's saying here that, you know, this disposition to esteem ourselves more highly often results in evil, evil surmisings and bitterness of spirit. The ordinance of humility preceding the Lord's Supper, the purpose of it, is to clear away these misunderstandings, to bring men out of his selfishness, down from his stilts of self-exaltation, to the humility of heart that will lead him to serve his brother. Then it says this, the holy watcher from heaven is present at this season to make it one of soul searching, of conviction of sin, and of blessed assurance of sins forgiven. You understand what she's saying here? Even now at this moment, the holy watcher is here. And the Holy Watcher wants us to come to grips with who we are when we don't have absolute dependence on Jesus. 
when we let go even a little. And so then, you know, it, it's basically Psalm 139, 20, 23 and 24. It says, oh, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we really let God search our hearts, what might we see? Well, it's right here in Desire of Ages. Should I read it? It says, a chain of memories is called up, memories of God's great goodness and of the favor and tenderness of earthly friends, of blessings forgotten, of mercies abused, of kindnesses slighted. These are called to mind. Roots of bitterness have crowded out the precious plant of love are made manifest. Defects of character, neglect of duties, ingratitude to God, coldness toward our brethren are called to remembrance. Sin is seen in the light in which God views it. Our thoughts are not thoughts of self-complacency, but of severe self-censure and humiliation. The mind is energized to break down every barrier that has caused alienation. Evil thinking and evil speaking are put away. Sins are confessed. They are forgiven. The subduing grace of Christ comes into the soul, and the love of Christ draws hearts together in a blessed unity. Now, I just want to say this. I mean, I remember as a kid, um, the Ordinance of Humility and Communion seemed like such a solemn service. And what I've just shared shows that the solemnity is especially connected to the Ordinance of Humility because that's the soul-searching time. That's the time when we realize, man, without the grace of Christ, I'm certainly unworthy to participate in this, this um, ceremony. It's a heart-searching time. But when the ordinance of humility is done, if it's done its work, even though it's still a solemn service, the communion service should be have inherent joy. It should. And I'm going to share what she says about it. It says, as the lesson of the preparatory service is thus learned, the desire is kindled for a higher spiritual life. To this desire, the divine witness will respond. The soul will be uplifted. We can partake of the communion with a consciousness of sins forgiven. The sunshine of Christ's righteousness will fill the chambers of the mind and the soul temple. We behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. To those who receive the spirit of this service, it can never become a mere ceremony. You know, as a um, pastor of a five-church district once, I did a lot of communion services. <laughs> And my biggest fear was that it would just start to get boring and routine and mundane. But you know what? Every, no matter which church I was going to, to do it, before the ordinance of humility, the Lord worked on my heart and always brought me to that humility. And when that happens, it doesn't matter how many times you communion, it's still going to be a joy. And it was every, every time, every single time I did communion, I felt uplifted. Because it's a promise. When you let the ordinance of humility do its work, the communion will always be a tremendous blessing. So it says, whenever this ordinance is rightly celebrated, the children of God are brought into a holy relationship to help and bless each other. So as you know that, um, you know, church practices uh, open communion. We, people who, you know, maybe visiting, if they want to do the ordinance of humility, they're certainly welcome to. But what we should be praying for, each one of us for ourselves, is for a, a full heart surrender as we proceed with the foot washing. And I encourage you to pray with the person you're serving. You know, I've been to churches where people just wash the other feet and they don't even pray with one another. It's like, how can you really get in the spirit of service if you don't pray for each other when you serve each other? So make sure you do that. Uh, I think the women are in this room over off the foyer. Um, and the men are in the Pathfinder room. And I believe the uh, fellowship hall is where families, married couples will be. So let's separate at this time for the Ordinance of Humility. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to Him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 
492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.